webinar. Uh, my name is Jennifer Hicks. I'm the OpenSIM R&D Manager and the Associate Director of the National Center for Simulation and Rehab Research. I'll be serving as the moderator for today's webinar. Uh, so I'm pleased to welcome today's presenter, we have two. Uh, it's Rob Sisson and Elena Kaluber joining us uh, from Ohio State University. Uh, today they will be presenting uh, on simulating fit to stand both biomechanical insights and practical tips. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so a couple uh, some background before we get started. Uh, so OpenSim is a freely available software application for visualizing musculoskeletal structures and simulating movements of humans and animals. Uh, many of you may already know this, but with our webinars, we typically draw in lots of beginners and people who are new to OpenSim as well. Uh, so if you're new, the application also, uh, so it includes tools for general purpose inverse dynamics, optimization to estimate muscle and joint forces, uh, methods so you can create simulations in motion posture, and then analyze and visualize the results of your simulation. Uh, so you'll see some of those tools in action during that moment of webinar today. Uh, because that's the first goal of our webinar series, to showcase cutting edge research that's being performed with OpenSim and its various tools and algorithms. Uh, OpenSim is also a growing geographically diverse community of users. So the second goal of our webinar series is to provide an easy platform for the OpenSim community to communicate and collaborate. So next slide. Before we get started, uh, a couple quick reminders about the format of the webinar. Uh, so we want to have time to answer your questions, uh, but all those questions will be text-based and at the end of the presentation. Uh, so there's a text-based Q&A panel where after the presentation you can type in your questions for Rob and Elena. Uh, if you need any technical help, uh, you can consult the guide on our website uh, or send the host a chat message. All right, next slide. So now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Uh, so first, Dr. Rob Sisson is an associate professor in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at The Ohio State University. Uh, that's also his alma mater, where he got his undergrad degree. Uh, he earned his master's and PhD uh, here in the Mechanical Engineering Department at Stanford University. Uh, for his PhD work, he built an integral custom surgical navigation system uh, for total knee arthroplasty. Uh, his research interests are in neuromuscular biomechanics, a field that's at the interface of engineering, mechanics, orthopedics, and physical medicine and rehab. Uh, Rob is joined today by his graduate student, Elena Carruthers. Uh, Elena completed her undergraduate training at Hope College in 2012 uh, with a dual major in mechanical engineering and dance. Uh, during her senior year, she worked in the motion analysis lab at Mary C. Bed Rehabilitation Hospital, uh, which drew her to biomechanics research. Elaine is also the winner of an NSF graduate fellowship. Uh, she's in her uh, third year currently working with Rob as a graduate student. Uh, so I'm really excited uh, for today's talk. Uh, it's a great mix of both research, uh, research insights, and also practical tips on using open for research. Uh, so with that, I will pass the mic over to Elena and Rob. Uh, take it away, guys. Thank you, Jen. We appreciate that very nice introduction. So we're going to talk about the sit-to-stand transfer, which the sit-to-stand transfer is a fancy way of saying rising out of a chair. And here's a simulation of what rising out of a chair looks like in open sim. So we're going to talk about how we got to that point and some good science along the way, but also some of the uh, practical tips that we, being Elena, had to face while we went about doing this work. So a bit of an outline of what our objectives are going to be. First of all, we're going to talk about the background, why we want to study the sit to stand motion, talk about the scientific goals of our study. We're going to talk about how we accomplish these scientific goals using OpenSIM, the challenges that we had, and again, the challenges by we meaning what Elena had during this talk, how we meaning Elena overcame these challenges, our major scientific research findings and also some take home messages along the way. So we started this work by wondering 
why we should study this problem, we start looking around in the natural habitat of graduate students. And if you look at the natural habitat of graduate students, they're always sitting down in your chair, typically slumped over a computer, always working diligently on their research. So I asked Elena, don't you think those two, three times a day where you get out of a chair, you might want to know how you're doing it. So that's really the purpose of why we're doing this work. Isn't that right? Well, no, actually. So most of us take for granted in the fact that we can complete this task easily and independently. But over 6% of community-dwelling older adults and over 60% of nursing home residents have difficulty accomplishing this task independently. And because of this difficulty, this physician transfer task is often used to assess functional performance in older adults. Now, in order to complete a sit-to-stand transfer, sufficient strength and power must be generated by the leg muscles to develop adequate joint torque that allow the individual to raise their center of mass over their base of support. Several studies have looked into sit-to-stand transfer and have divided it into phases uh, just to look at it a little more closely. So we start uh, sitting in the chair. Phase one in the forward leaning phase begins when lumbar flexion increases from about half a degree from your beginning position. And this phase is just when you're leaning your torso forward. And then phase two is the momentum transfer phase when you're shifting your momentum from where you were seated onto uh, your base of support uh, begins when maximum hip flexion is reached. And then the last phase, the extension phase, when you're extending all of your joints, begins when maximum dorsiflexion is reached. And then you go into a full standing upright position. Now, past the stand transfer studies have used biomechanical rigid body models driven by net reaction torsion forces informed by experimental techniques, whether that's EMG or ground reaction forces. But there's a problem. We as humans are not driven by torque generators. So we cannot determine the function of individual muscles from torques alone due to the complex dynamics of the human body. So we can use muscle-driven simulations to investigate how individual muscles contribute to the coordination of a particular movement, and in our case, a sit to stand transfer. But why do we even care about muscle forces? Well, by knowing what muscles drive a particular motion, it potentially informs rehabilitation strategies to improve a patient's functional performance during that task. So our, for our study, our purpose was to first examine the individual muscle forces, so basically what those uh, muscle drivers were in the sit to stand transfer task. But we also wanted to look at interland differences in the maximum muscle forces per phase of sit to stand transfer in young healthy populations. Uh, and this comes from the fact that lower limb muscle force symmetry is often assumed in young healthy populations. And if it's deviated from this, it's often assumed that there might be some type of pathology or movement complication. So we wanted to look at that with respect to the sit to stand transfer. So for testing, we analyzed seven healthy subjects, five male and two female, with an average age of around 23. We used a motion capture system, in which we placed reflective markers that were focused on the lower limb using the point cluster technique and used eight by con cameras to capture their motion for the task. We also uh, collected ground reaction forces with two force plates, one placed underneath each foot, but now we're placed underneath the chair. And then lastly, we use bilateral surface EMG for lower extremity muscles to get the muscle excitation during that task. For our sit to stand transfer uh, trials, we had a subject sit in a hard back armless chair, and the seat was raised about 55 centimeters off the ground. And with their arms crossed, we asked, we asked each subject to rise from the chair as naturally as possible, pause for two seconds, and then return to sitting in the chair. They completed this three times, and for our purposes in this study, we only looked at the rising portion, rising portion of this task and only analyzed one trial per subject. So with this sit to stand trial, we generated simulations using the open source software package OpenSIM and a generic musculoskeletal model, GATE2392. And here's just a general workflow of the steps that we used to simulate uh, this motion, and I'm just gonna go over this briefly. So first we have our uh, scaling, and we wanted to scale this generic uh, musculoskeletal model to the subject's body size by using the static calibration trial that was collected for each subject. And the model was able to be matched to the subject's body size by using the relative distances between pairs of markers. 
um, to determine each length of the body segment. And then once the model was scaled, we were able to reproduce the Sitistan trial by using in inverse kinematics, which uses a weighted least squares approach in order to minimize the distance between the experimental markers and the model markers. And then with these joint angles, as well as the ground reaction forces collected from those force plates we used, we were able to implement the inverse dynamics tool in order to get the joint torques that were developed about each of the joints for each frame of the trial. And then these joint torques were further resolved by using static optimization, which minimizes the sum of the activation squared in order to get muscle activations and muscle forces during this task. Now, after having run this first round of simulations, I really wanted to take a look into the muscle forces, particularly in the back, because in phase one, that torso movement is quite um, large. So here's a, one of Elena's muscle forces, Victor Spinae, and then your back. And Elena, is it? Normal for muscle force to go up to a certain value, hold that value for about a half a second, and then fall off? Probably not, especially in a healthy population. Okay, so what's the peak isometric force for this muscle? What's the max amount of force this muscle can produce? Well, if you go in the GUI, you can find the peak isometric force and 2,500. So what value are, are we getting? 2,500. So in a young, healthy population getting out of the chair, do you think someone maximally activates their back muscle uh, for about a half a second? I would hope not. So you're not going to graduate, that's what you're saying? No, we'll fix this problem. <laughs> oh, you want to fix the problem and yeah. graduate. Okay. So uh, if the data looks wrong or potentially wrong or kind of funny, one of our uh, big tips is to actually go and look at the simulation as if something looks a little wonky in the simulation, so your data is kind of wonky, you might be able to notice it by watching the animation. So here we have on the left the animation from Vicon Nexus from the motion capture system. Then on the right we have our model uh, simulated in OpenSim. Uh, so that might have gone kind of quick, so let's take a still shot of those and, and explain if there are any differences. And did you see anything? Yeah, so if you look at phase one, so when you're le leaning that torso forward, you can see in the gate 2392 model on the right that the line the spine is making is more flat in comparison to what is actually happening in the person shown on the left. And this is because the torso is modeled as a rigid object in the gate 2392 model and has a ball and socket joint with a pelvis. Because the gate 2392 model is often used for analyzing walking and running, but not for tasks such as the Okay, so we can use gate 2392 very successfully for walking, running, and other tasks where the torso is mostly upright. I know there are a lot of good models that are shared by a bunch of researchers that are available in OpenSim. So there's got to be one that we can use to help us with this with this task. Well, I don't know if there's one out there right now. So when you were doing this work last year, you couldn't find one? No. So we could just quit? No. We're not quitting. So I guess that means we have to make our own model. So and that's you what I this model. So I created the full body model 2013. And because OpenSim is an open source software, I was able to take other models that people had created in order to develop one that would suit the purposes of my study. So the first model that I used as a base was the lower limb model 2010. And it was just a common model that is often used now. And so I just took the pelvis and the legs, starting as my base, and then built off of that, used an articulated spine model developed by Christophe, which had uh, three degrees of freedom in the lumbar vertebrae, which are those five lower uh, vertebrae in your spine. And I also took the rest of the spine, as well as those back and ab muscles. But I did not use the pelvis or the rib cage, but rather I used my own rib cage, as well as arms and a head and neck, and the arms and head and neck were from Dr. Kate Saul. And we wanted to use uh, these arms so that for future studies we could compare using to stand with arms versus not using arms. So just to give a little uh, background as to how you combine these models, first, Notepad++ becomes your friend. So what you can do in Notepad++ is open up your .ocean file or the model. And if you convert the language to XML, you can see that there's these different blocks um, 
for each of the characteristics of the model. So first we have the body set, and that's where all the bones and their geometries are located. Then we have the constraint set, in case we want to constrain any of the uh, joint range of motions or anything of that nature. Then we also have the force set, which includes the muscles and the properties, such as force length and force velocity curves, as well as their attachments to a certain muscle or to certain bones. And then the marker set, which has the model's markers placement with respect to uh, different parent bodies. And then we didn't use this, but there's also a contact geometry set in case you want to have different contacts uh, with the ground and such. So when combining these, it's really make sure you have to make sure that the models are scaled to the same size person. And if not, you need to adjust for that. So for my case, I had one model that was scaled to 1.7 meter male and another model that was a 1.8 meter male. And so you really want to make sure that when developing this model, it's representative of one subject of one size. You need to make sure that the masses and the length, uh, the mass uh, moment of inertia are all consistent between that one representative size. And then I also use the marker editor to determine the relationship between two bodies that was unknown. And this happened in a couple cases when I was developing this model. Um, I had to put on a new rib cage uh, onto this new spine that I have from Christopher as well as the Arnold's lower leg. And when given the rib cage and the arm, I was not given the relationship of that body with respect to the spine or the lower limb. And so I needed to use the marker editor in order to determine the placement of Christopher's rib cage relative to one of his vertebrae, and then have that same relationship with the new rib cage that I was going to be putting on. So just to give you a little um, preview to what this, what this would look like, if you open up your model and then right click onto the marker set and press add new, you're going to create a new marker. And let's say you select the body, which you can, it's a drop down menu. So I selected pelvis and you want it at its origin. So you select the location and zero, zero, zero. As you can see here, it's right at the origin. So let's say we want to know that marker's placement with respect to the right tibia. So what you can do is select under the body, select right tibia. And then if you press enter, you should get that uh, marker's relationship with respect to that new body, the tibia, which is really helpful for my case. And then lastly, you want to make sure that you use the act, parallel axis theorem to adjust the moments of inertia of the newly added bodies that have different origins. And this came into play because there were different things called uh, torso, whether it was the entire spine or the spine and the rib case. So I just had to adjust for that because there were different origins and different parent bodies for different things. So you really want to make sure that your moments of inertia are consistent and that overall your model is consistent in terms of being representative of one subject of one subject size. Well, that sounds kind of fancy. Uh, did you do any other checks? Because all that coding can make some mistakes. Did yeah. you do any, any checks that you have confidence in this new model? Yeah, so because I used the lower land model 2010 as my base, I didn't change anything from that. I particularly looked at my torso. And first of all, I looked at the moment arms of both uh, abdomen and back muscles, the rectus spinae and the rectus abdominis. Uh, you can see here in the full body model is in solid, and in the dash line is the lumbar model created by Christopher. You can see here that between the two muscles, they match uh, quite well. And then I also looked at the fiber length of these two muscles, uh, comparing the full body and lumbar model, and they also match quite well. But I'll, rather than just looking at these muscle properties, I also wanted to see how the model actually moved. So what I did was took a representative uh, date trial from one of our subjects, and ran it both on the lower limb model 2010, which is my base, and then ran it again with my full body model 2013 to see if there would be good agreement between the two, to see how that newly added torso would affect things. And you can see here that if you look at the joint torques, they are in quite good agreement across the entire gait cycle. And then I also looked at muscle forces, uh, particularly at, at the soleus and the gastric muscles, as well as uh, the hamstring muscles, and you can see here that the shapes of the curves match quite well. There are some um, differences in terms of magnitude, which would be expected due to the extra flexibility in this torso now that would affect the back muscles, that would affect the uh, lower limb muscle forces as well. But overall, we are pleased with this, and we'll soon be publishing it um, and have it freely available to those. Um, so we after having created this model, we ran a second round of simulation, except we used our full body model 2013. 
And it should be noted that during these simulations, I had the model's arms crossed because that's how the subject had uh, their arms placed when they completed the Sigistan trial. And then I also took out the arm muscles because when I left them in the first time, uh, static optimization went to calculate all these muscle forces, and I am not interested in the arm muscle forces during this task and more focused on the lower limb uh, muscle forces, so I just took out the arm muscles. So here we can see a simulation of our stand transfer. You see that nice curvature in the back and the fact that the arms are in a locked top position, and it does look like someone is getting out of the chair, which is pretty cool. So here one more time, just for a side-by-side -side comparison of these models, looking at that forward leaning phase once again. On the left, we have the lower extremity model 2010, and on the right, our full body model 2013. And you can see here on the right that the curvature of the spine is being captured by the model, whereas in the lower extremity model 2010, it is not. And then if we look at our back muscle forces again, uh, we have our lower extremity model reaching that peak of 2,500, but if we look at the full body model 2013, it's decreased by about half, which seems more anatomically realistic, especially in this young, healthy population. So, okay, so Elaine is feeling super confident here, maybe a little too confident. Hey. And like any good advisor, I have to squash her, 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 her enthusiasm here. So one of the things that is also important to do in a simulation is, if possible, compare the muscle activations you get from simulation to experimental e EMV to see if they are in good agreement with each other. Now, ideally, you would do this for the same person. If not, you can do this from the, from the l l literature as well. And this is even listed as one of the best practices in troubleshooting. So if you can find EMG or muscle activation data, ideally from your own subject or from others in the literature, is the timing of the activation, the activation mass, are the magnitudes and patterns in fairly good agreement with one another. So let's take a look at that. Elena. All right, so just to familiarize yourself with these plots, first in black, we have the experimental EMG activation, and then in blue, we have the static optimization activation, and each has a shaded error bar for one standard deviation, and the experimental EMG activation values were normalized to the peak of what static optimization activation was. So, if we look at our gluteus maximus and our vastus lateralis, we can see here that the magnitudes of the peaks as well as the timing of the peaks match quite well. But if we looked at muscles such as directus femoris, neogastrocnemius, or the soleus, the timing as well as some of the magnitudes are off, especially if we look at this neogastrocnemius after the so you're still not going to graduate, is what you're saying? No, I'll just fix it. Oh, we can fix it. Okay. So I know uh, if you're using computed muscle control or CMC, it is possible to restrict these activations. You can have them on and off at a certain magnitude for a certain time. Can we do that also with uh, static optimization? I don't know. Let's look at what the capabilities are of open and release notes. So you can access these release notes. Uh, by going into the user's guide, and I looked at the one for 2.2, and it said that there was an added ability to set the bounds on controls for actuators and static optimization. Sounds good. So did you find how to, you find how to do that on, online? I don't know. I can't find it. So, you can't. so can you do this one? I need help. You need help. Okay. So there's got to be someone available that if we have this problem with Bad EMG. There's got to be someone who can call, right? Yeah. Jeff Reinbold! So, why are we calling Jeff Reinbold? And who is Jeff Reinbold? And what does he have to do with anything like that? So, Jeff Reinbold is an assistant professor of mechanical aerospace and biomedical engineering at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Uh, Jeff and I were both working as a postdoc at Stanford back in 2006, but none of that might, might be broadly applicable here other than it's a nice story and how Jeff and I know each other. More important to this conversation is that Jeff Reinbolt is an inaugural OpenSim Fellow. Now, if you're not familiar with the OpenSim Fellow program, this fellow program is a collection of expert users of OpenSim who have 
agreed to provide advice to the OpenSIM community for issues just like this one here. And we also knew that Dr. Reinbolt was involved in the creation of the static optimization uh, routine within OpenSIM. So we called up Dr. Reinbolt and said, the release note says we can restrict this activation. We can't figure out how to do it on our own. Can you help us? And what did he say? Well, he an answer that I liked. He said it could be done. And if you go back into our notepad plus plus file, it's particularly in the muscle force set, you can insert these few couple lines of code. And this allows you to set a minimum and maximum control for those activation values. And the default minimum control is 0 0.02. And then the maximum control uh, that can be reached is 1 or 100% activation. Now, it should be noted that when setting these lower bounds, that it's going to be set across the entire trial, uh, which is unlike CMC, where you can set these bounds for a particular time period. So that needs to be taken into consideration when setting these lower bounds. So how did I set these bounds? Well, here again, we have the experimental EMG in black and the static optimization results in blue. And you can see here that there's that huge gap again. Well, I first looked at the black EMG here that we have and saw what its most lowest value was uh, across the entire SuperStand trial. And I didn't want to choose zero, just because that wouldn't make sense to set our lower bound to zero, because that's what we want to avoid. So after I looked at the EMG here, I went into the Notepad++ file for that particular muscle, the medial gastrocnemius, and then changed that default value of 0 0.02 to that lower bound value, which is around 0 0.036. So that's what I changed it to, so it would set that lower bound. And then I did that for all the other muscles that I EMG data on by setting that lower bound across that entire sit stand cycle. So by setting these lower bounds, I had to save the model as a new model. Then I would rerun stack optimization uh, as it would uh, obey these new lower bounds. So after having rerun the simulation, here on the left we have our old results having that huge gap. But then we have this uh, good agreement between the EMG and the static optimization results, where those lower bound values are being uh, met in good agreement. And you can see here that, once again, it's also being met across other muscles as well. So after having done this for all the subjects, I did the average results. And you can see here for the gluteus maximus and massus lateralis that, once again, we're in good agreement in terms of magnitude and heat, and that once uh, the medial gastric and soleus didn't meet, now are matching quite well. But now that the rectus femoris, there's still a problem here, that the magnitude uh, at the beginning of the stand is quite high in comparison to the EMG. All right, so what's going on here? Uh, Lenny would still like to finish this manuscript at, at some point. Yeah. So are we still wrong? Well, it's important to recognize that static optimization is solving a muscle redundancy problem. You have joint torques about the hip the knee and the ankle. So you have three different lower extremity joint torque. You have multiple muscles crossing all of those joints. So static optimization is solving this muscle redundancy problem where you have more muscles and more unknowns than you have, have e e e e equations. So what we're looking for, is there another way to check results are quote unquote right other than using EMG because maybe we uh, just want another way of checking what our results are. And we think there is. And what we can do is look at this relationship, where we know the force of a muscle times its moment arm is equal to the joint torque. So we're going to check if the force as estimated from static optimization times the muscle moment arms equals the torque that we calculated from inverse dynamics. So we, or Elena, we're going to do that. What do you find? All right. So first. We have our muscle forces over time, but we need to get our moment arms over time. And in order to do that, you can open up your model and then load the motion that you want to look at those moment arms for. So in my case, I loaded this at the stand trial. Then I went into the plot tool, and you click on Y quantity, and you select whichever moment arm you want. And I chose hip flexion for this case. And then you can select whatever muscles cross that joint. And so I chose the rectus femoris. And then lastly, for the X quantity, you want to go all the way down to the bottom and select coordinate, and that's just going to give you your moment arm over time, which is going to look something like this. So after having gotten this moment arm over time, having our muscle forces, 
then I was able to check the inverse dynamics result and compare that with the values that I had calculated using the a new technique. And you can see here that between the inverse dynamics, which is in solid, and the calculated joint torque values, which are in dashed line, match up quite well. And especially for the ankle, as the dashed line is right underneath the solid, that the inverse dynamics and the calculated values are spot on. So we're quite happy with these results. So we generally agree with the EMG. We really like the check between um, muscle forces giving rise to moments and inverse dynamics. Keep on going, Elena. All right, so just a refresher on what our purpose was, was to first look at those muscle forces and then inner limb differences in our uh, subject population. So if we have force on the y-axis and then percent to the stand cycle on the x, we look at the quadricep muscles. You can see here that the rectus femoris in green uh, has a higher force than the rest of these quadricep muscles, most likely due to the fact that static optimization calculated a high activation value for that muscle. But if you look at the back side muscles, you can see here that they reach their peak in phase two uh, when maximum hip flexion is reached, and then decrease in phase three when you're starting to get into that standing position. And then it's also very similar for the gluteus maximus, the bicep femoris long head, reaching their peaks in phase two, and then decreasing in phase three. But lastly, if we look at the soleus and medial gastrocnemius, those plantar flexors, Rather than decreasing in phase three, they're continuing to increase to help you maintain that standing position so that you don't fall over. So overall, we can see here that those quadricep muscles, the vasi in particular, as well as the gluteus maximus, are some of the main drivers in the superstand passive task. But to take a little closer look at these muscle forces, we did a three-way repeated measures ANOVA and looked at the effects of maximum muscle force on, uh, with respect to muscle phase and then leg, and each subject's leg was uh, the right and left leg. One was chosen as dominant and the other as non-dominant. And the dominant leg was the uh, one that generated the greatest ground reaction force in the vertical direction during uh, the stand trial. And then we also looked at the interaction effects between muscle phase and leg. So from the ANOVA results, we have that muscle phase, as well as the interaction between leg and muscle, and the interaction between phase and muscle were significant. And then we also use a Chuki post hoc pairwise comparison test in order to look at which muscles generated the greatest amount of force during the sit stand uh, transfer. So if you look here in the group uh, column, whichever muscle's letters do not uh, match those of the other muscles it indicates that that muscle generated a, a significantly different muscle force than the others. So for this case, the vast lateralis produced the largest amount of force uh, in comparison to all these other muscles, as this letter is different from everyone else. But if you can see here for the rectus femoris and the bicep femoris, their letters are the same, indicating that they are not significantly different from each other. And then same for the soleus and medial gastric. And then we wanted to look at the effect of limb uh, further, as well as to investigate that lower limb muscle force symmetry in a young healthy population. And we did this by using a pair two test to investigate the physical significance of inner limb differences and maximum muscle forces per phase. And inner limb differences were quantified as a percent difference between the maximum muscle force produced in the dominant leg versus the non-dominant leg. So if you look here in this table, we have each of the muscles and then the percent differences across each of the phases. And those shaded in purple were found to be statistically significant. Uh, which would be for the gluteus maximus and the soleus across all three phases. So the gluteus maximus has a positive percent difference, indicating that the gluteus maximus in the dominant leg generated a greater uh, force than the gluteus maximus in the non-dominant leg. And this is uh, the opposite for the soleus, that the soleus in the non-dominant leg generated a greater amount of force um, than the soleus in the dominant leg. And this um, may have to do with some kind of compensation method due to the great amount of force produced by the dominant leg. And then lastly, if we just take a look at these percent differences in their standard deviation, some of them are greater than the percent difference averages, which uh, indicates that there's large variability here. But also that the percent differences in general are greater than 10%, indicating that we cannot assume lower than muscle symmetry in a young healthy population. So we're not perfect. As much as your advisors want to say that they're perfect, all PIs are not perfect. We make mistakes. Things don't always go to plan, like if we lost the sound here. So we have some shortcomings. One of our biggest shortcomings and our concern is that discrepancy in EMV uh, and stack optimization activation for the rectus femoris. It comes from a couple of different sources. 
there's a slight chance when the person sat down, something may have happened to the electrodes or the wires that on the physical EMV, how they're placed on muscles. It could be how the rectus femoris is characterized in this particular in this particular model, because even in the original original model model by Arnold, there's some differences between experimental uh, joint torques and what you can get from the model. And some of our earlier work by Thompson saw uh, high activation in the rectus when you were in a position of knee flexion and hip flexion, like you would be sitting down in the chair. So maybe that's an opportunity for future work. It could be an artifact how to stack activation between this calculating the muscle forces where you get the biggest bang for your buck from the rectus. Could be other muscles that we work modeling in detail, such as more core muscles. We didn't have EMG on the other hip flexors like the psoas, so it could be something happening there we didn't pay attention to. Also, we were not modeling the person chair interaction, so we didn't model contact between the person and the seat of the chair. Maybe we model this in a different way, we might get set a different. In any case, we think it's a great uh, study, we're learning some very novel insights into the muscles needed to rise from a chair. Additionally, uh, the subjects completed the sit to stand transfer with their arms crossed. You probably don't get out of a chair that way, so why would we do it that way? Even though it's not normal, it is the way this sit to stand transfer test is implemented in a clinical setting. So we wanted to establish a baseline with this study so that future studies of implementing this clinical test could be done with all the variables and much the same as, as possible. If at some point they would need to use their arms, our model has our arms for future capabilities. We also tested a young, healthy population, i.e. the grad students that were sitting around our, our lab. So these results are probably not representative of other populations, such as older adults, or those with a pathology such as osteoarthritis or cerebral palsy or something of that nature. So I just want to go over briefly, briefly some take-home lessons from Pitocan, uh, that the quadriceps and gluteus maximus were found to be the large drivers during this cast, and there was an interchange of regression in muscle force values between the quadriceps and the gluteus maximus with the gastrocnemius in phase two, and that lower limb asymmetry was present in the hand healthy population. For some take-home tips regarding open sin and performing simulations, uh, things might go wrong, except you got to take them in stride. Uh, first of all, if there's the data looks wonky, watch the sim simulation and watch the animation. If something looks wrong in the animation, it probably is, and that gives you a good insight as to where you can where you can look. A wrong-looking animation is hardly ever going to give you pristine-looking data coming out the other end. You should simplify whenever possible. We actually stripped out the upper extremity muscles in this model because we didn't want uh, those muscles being active and included in the uh, static optimization task. Verify your results. Uh, you can use experimental EMG to verify your results, and you also it's a good thing to check that your inverse dynamics joint reacts to joint moments matches the moments calculated by the force in the muscles times the respective moment arms. And last, perhaps uh, most importantly, you should ask for help. OpenSim is an open source software, but the really the key advantage we think is that it has a wonderful community using this uh, this platform. The OpenSim forum is a tremendous place where you can ask questions, have other users give you these answers, start a very provocative conversation. The release notes and the technical guide and the tutorials are all very helpful on the forum, and we made great use of Dr. Reinbold and the OpenSim Fellows Program. Uh, a bunch of acknowledgments here. I'd like to thank our co-authors, Drs. Thompson, Chowdhury, Schmidt, Saul, and Best from Ohio State. Uh, Dr. Saul is actually now in, is now at N N N NC State. She learns the upper extremity model. Our lab mates here at Ohio State, Dr. Reinbold at University of Tennessee. And as Jen mentioned at the beginning, we'd like to thank the National Science Foundation for a uh, fellowship for Elena for her pre-doctoral training. Thanks for listening. Thanks for uh, sitting through the technical difficulties. Happy to answer any questions now at this time. Elena, for a great talk, and thanks for 
staying cool, calm, and collected through those technical <laughs> difficulties. And, and thanks again to the audience for bearing with us. Um, now it's time to start the Q&A session. As I mentioned earlier, all of the questions will be text-based. Uh, so go to your WebEx controls, find the Q&A box. Uh, it probably appears on the bottom right, right of your screen. Uh, then type in your question, and make sure you select to ask all panelists so that uh, we see the question. Um, so let's see. Let me bring up and see if anyone's asked questions already. Okay, it looks like their questions are still coming in. Uh, so while the audience is, is entering their questions, I guess I'll ask one. Um, so you said that you, you pointed out very clearly in, in your limitations uh, that you didn't get the best match between the rectus femoris muscle EMG and the static the activations predicted by static optimization. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering if those discrepancies, how you think those discrepancies might affect some of the take home messages of your study, uh, if at all. Um, well, if you see in the rectus femoris with the EMG, it's, most, it's mostly, there's a difference at the beginning of the stance when they're in the chair, and the chair was not modeled, so they're basically like in a squat position. But if you go further into the stance trial, it does match, and that's really the phase, the phase two when you're having to shift that momentum forward is what we were really interested in. Mm -hmm. But it's probably the fact that the chair was not modeled, that person chair interaction um, mm -hmm. could not be modeled. Uh, was probably, I mean, it's definitely something to be considered when we uh, look at the stand in the future. And uh, it, it, I mentioned there, it's, it's very possible that the that motion at the beginning was from the rectus because it had a very large moment arm and could be other muscles could be, mm -hmm. could be doing it as well. And we did a lot more in-depth analysis as to whether there was a bunch of Focus contracting, for example, between the rectus and some of the hamstrings or the rectus and the gastro, anything antagonistic to the rectus that might be canceling out a high activation at the rectus. None of that was present in our uh, additional analysis. So ultimately, we're, we, we, we don't know uh, where that's coming from. Uh, my, my, question, Robin, my question was more, okay, there, there is this difference. How do you think it affected your conclusions about the important muscles for push-off or, you know, the, the actual conclusions that you drew? I wouldn't think it would impact them, honestly, that significantly because just in comparison to the rest of the quadricep muscles, the back side, they reached higher uh, muscle force values at the mm -hmm. phase that is probably the most difficult for people to complete who do have pathologies, um, or but even in the same healthy population. I'm just yeah. shifting so for that the, for the phase For the phase two, um, it, it, was, it wouldn't have a big effect. It's just you'd have right. to resolve yeah. it once you add arms and try to analyze yeah. that phase one. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Um, so now we have a bunch of questions from the audience. <laughs> Um, that's great. Uh, people yeah. are interested. So, let's see. First, we have a question from Ching Sai. Uh, he says, thanks for the talk. Uh, since there was no measurement of the chair body reaction forces, how did you perform the inverse dynamics calculation to obtain the net jo joint moments for the following static optimization? So, inverse dynamics, we don't, um, we just can input our kinematics. Uh, data as well as our force plates were just from the feet, um, and it can just run that simulation. We didn't need any input from the chair. It can just run it without it. It would basically just use the force plate underneath the feet, and we can resolve the uh, inverse dynamics equations using that motion, or those, using those forces yeah. for our motion. Okay, so you you looked at the phase where the the person was already yeah, and so uh, like the chair. yeah, and also for like how we decided the phases, it was all based off of kinematic uh, mm -hmm. data rather than looking at if the force plate if it were to be on the chair to be zero. So that's how we looked at that too. Okay, thanks. Now moving on to another question from Allison Arnold. 
Uh, she's wondering if there's a reason why you chose to use static optimization instead of computed muscle control. Thanks, Alice. That's a really good question. So um, one of the reasons was that because we weren't modeling the chair body reaction, the model was freaking out a bit during RRA. So RRA is the residual residual reduction algorithm within OpenSim. If you are a newer user here at OpenSim, and because you weren't giving it that force measured under the person on, on the chair, it shows up as a residual force yeah. in, in in the simulation. Yeah, the pelvic forces were basically equal to the person's body weight. Um, at that beginning part of the scan transfer, and it was just, it just freaked out. And because we didn't have that force place data on the chair, so we just went with the static optimization. And, and because one of our main questions was, or it is, what are what are the muscle forces? We knew there are two different ways to get there. So we just chose static optimization because we were able to resolve that inverse dynamics problem mm -hmm. rather than trying to force the RRA and CMC pathway, which might not have been the best way to go given, given our experimental setup. Uh, I, I have a follow-up question to that. I mean, with static optimization, you still have to have uh, dynamic consistency, so F has to equal MA. That's what the RRA is trying to, to figure out and make happen. So you must have still had um, a residual actuator at the pelvic for static yeah. optimization that was applying some forces too, right? Yes, and it did turn out that there were also large pelvic forces at the beginning that were mm -hmm. equal to, once again, that person's body weight just because that interaction with the chair was not taken account for in our um, force plate data. And mm -hmm. so we just, to be honest, just went with it just because it made sense that they're basically sitting in a squat in the air, and so OpenSim has to calculate that as, okay, I'm just going to put as much um, force as much as they're putting on the chair, so. Mm -hmm. I, I guess the follow-up to that is also, I mean, one of the one of the main a key difference between static optimization and CMC is that static optimization assumes uh, a rigid tendon, uh, which can be a problem for higher speed motions like running. Uh, right. But for the sit to stand activity, it seems like a, a safe assumption, and it's you yeah. know faster and and can be easier to use. So that that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Right, and uh, I think we are one of the first, if not the first, uh, simulation that's really doing an interaction between a object in the in in the in in environment. Like that, you're putting your weight on, especially. All right, so there's, a, there's been there's been a lot of a lot of gait, a lot of running, of different pathologies, all that sort of thing. So this is our first attempt at interacting with, uh, a, with in this case, a chair, and then rising up from that, from that chair. So whether you can do it in a different way with a different model, with a different approach in the future, I mean, it's very fair possible. Game, yeah. yeah, it's fair, fair game. You can make definitely make improvements going forward. We don't claim that this be the end all be all study, but we think it's a very important, good first step that yields some great clinical insights into what muscles are the key drivers, but also that in a healthy, normal population, the variability between the limbs was remarkably large so that you couldn't assume that the muscles on either leg are doing approximately the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, moving on to the next question, this is from Thomas Correa. Uh, what are the Fmax values for the key muscles for sit to stand based on, uh, particularly the back muscles, but also the leg muscles? Sorry, what values? Yeah, where did you get the values for the maximum isometric force in the, in the muscles? Oh, the back okay. And also so the in the open sim, if you just look at the screen, um, in the GUI, so if you, there's like different panels that are on the screen, you have like where your model is, and then on the left, um, it shows your model and it has like all the muscles and bones, but on the box below that, so on like the bottom left corner, 
you can, if you have selected one of the muscles in your model, you can um, just see all its muscle properties, including force length curve, max life, max force, all that good stuff. And, and all those muscle properties initially were developed from cadaveric studies yeah. in, a, in, a, in a primary sense. So in this case, uh, the lower extremity was from Arnold, the upper extremity was from Saul, and they have great papers as to how they estimated what all these muscle properties are, because it really takes a long time to build a good model, and we are grateful to build off of the hard work of those who came for us here. Great, thanks. Um, is your, your paper is already public? We're in the process it, it, right now. It, it, yes, in the, in the process. As soon as it is out and published, we will let you know. Yeah, yeah. So, when, and I'm sure you'll you'll reference the study so that people can look up. Um, yeah. Where you yeah. got the the FMAX data as well. Absolutely. Um, so I guess a, a related question from Andrew Merriweather was when when do you think the model will be available for others to use and test? In the next couple months, probably. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I finished qualifying exams first, but after that. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um. And then let's see, now a question from Dan Robbins. And um, this is more a, a, a methods question. Uh, how easy is it to import movement data into OpenSIM? Do you do this directly or do you use other software? Import what kind of data? Just oh, General movement data. motion data. So mark and garden action pulse data. I assume. So like using the load motion feature or? So, um, so, I guess so, so Jen, I think what you're asking is, if you have motion capture data from a gate analysis laboratory, yep. how to input that motion in, into the open sim and, in mm -hmm. environment. Okay. And there's actually a nice toolbox available. Yeah, right? there's like, you can convert the uh, data from um, the, Vi the Vicon or whatever motion capture stuff you use to convert it to a file that open sim can read a TRC file. And there's a gate extract toolbox that uh, is available, I believe, that can help you convert that, and then you can input that when running inverse kinematics, inverse dynamics, all that good stuff. The gate, the gate extract toolbox, I believe that from Tim Doran, if I'm remembering that correctly, is a tremendously useful mm -hmm. uh, toolbox because back in the day when we were doing this on our own, we had some grad students writing the code on their own, and that's really quite a long and tedious process. So using the freely available Gate extract toolbox helps you to move from the motion capture environment into the open sim environment, which just speaks to one of the advantages of open sim. When someone builds either a great model or a great application, you can freely share that so others can then use it, which saves you a tremendous amount of time from having to replicate what someone else had already done. Yeah, to, to, to follow up on that, um, we're also working on an update to some of the, the toolbox that Tim provided. And if you go to the OpenSim user guide, there's a whole chapter on preparing your data. And at the end of that, there's a table that links to some of the various tools that have been developed by uh, Tim Doran, for example, and other users as well. Okay, let's see. Okay, now a question from Will Anderton. Uh, what resources, if any, have been used or are available to adjust model moments of inertia to particular human subjects? I honestly just did it by hand. I looked at, I used the parallel axis theorem and just used that formula to look at the different origins of the bodies that I was trying to alter the um, moment of inertia for. I didn't really use anything complex. I just did a huge Excel spreadsheet and just did the parallel axis theorem. The, the beauty of the scale feature within OpenSim is that it handles all of that for you. So doing that parallel axis theorem is really only necessary if you're building a model right. from scratch. Scaling within OpenSim handles all the uh, changes of mass and size for you. Okay. Yeah, I think there are some other um, tools that are in the works from um, – uh, Tor Bezier, for example, using imaging data um, yeah. to develop some subject-specific models, too, or um, Ilse Yonkers has some, some tools as well uh, 
com coming out hopefully to the to the community. Um, I think we have time for one uh, final question. Everybody um, on you. Let's see. Um, so, so I guess to wrap up, um, a couple questions have come up about uh, the arm and and what their role would be. Um, so, do you guys know, for example, um, in a, in a typical stand, fit to stand, uh, what percentage of the, the external force comes from the arm, uh, and how it how it might affect the activity in general? I purchase, I don't know that number right off the bat. I mean, but having the capability of using arms is greatly going to affect how you use your leg, and just because they have. Uh, subject or have patients cross their arms in the clinic. We just wanted to have that as a good baseline comparison. Mm -hmm. um, but let's say if you have someone who has weak quadriceps or other weak muscles, they're probably going to have to compensate for that weakness by having to use their arm. Um, just because the quadriceps were found to be a large uh, muscle group that drove uh, the sit stand motion. Um, but mm -hmm. it's something definitely to take a look at um, with our model two by incorporating the arms. Yeah, it sounds like a, a good next study. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, so I think uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up now. If you guys can move on to the, there's a couple more slides just to, to conclude. Um, next slide, I think. So uh, Open Sim and this webinar series are supported by several grants. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Uh, so uh, several grants from the NIH, including the NIH grant that funds our National Center for Simulation and Rehab Research, uh, were also supported by the DARPA Warrior Web effort. Uh, and I, I really, uh, next slide, want to thank everyone for a great discussion, uh, all the great questions. I want to thank Rob and Elena again for a really great talk. Um, if you want to get more information about Open Sim, the center, upcoming events, uh, and other resources like some of the ones that Rob and Elena mentioned, uh, you can find links to all of those on our website, openSim.stanford.edu. Uh, we also uh, would love if you guys could complete a the survey that's going to appear in a pop-up window at the conclusion of the webinar. This will help us improve the webinars and, and choose upcoming topics. Uh, so thank you again, everyone. Participating, and we hope you'll continue to stay involved with OpenSense. Thanks.